9 billion people on this planet sooner or later, or at least in our lifetime, for sure. That means there will be 9 billion people getting older and requiring more and more energy and healthcare attention, and we need to find solutions. We need to find new technologies that help us tackle these challenges that society is facing. Nanotechnology is one of the buzzwords that you keep finding in the news, and in journals such as Nature, you find uh, advertisement uh, about new muscles, so carbon nanotubes could be used to create muscles or they could be used to create ultra-strong and lightweight composite materials, even ribbon to the stars, um, space elevators is a buzzword as well. Today I want to show you that there is more out there than just uh, flat lands or nanotubes, there are particles, so they are 0D, 1D and 2D nanomaterials, they have all these fascinating properties that we heard about earlier and um, we can make them we see them in the lab, we can go to some applications, we have applications on the market based on some nanomaterials, but there's a lot out there because we can just go through the periodic system of elements and combine them. You know. How big are these nanomaterials? To give you an idea, you compare a football or a C60 molecule to a football that's roughly the same ratio as the football to the earth, and with one molecule we can't do anything, we need lots of them. So how do we make lots of them? That's the challenge because we can't be just staying in the lab. So there are two ways uh, of approaching this. is a top-down method, which you saw earlier in the talk, and the bottom-up approach, where we also play Lego, but we use molecules or atoms that we assemble in different ways to create either particles or tubes or sheets or combinations thereof. If you think about these methods, uh, one particular method that we're using in our lab is based on chemical vapor deposition and for chemical vapor deposition you need basically three ingredients. Each one of you in this room could come to my lab and in an afternoon you would be producing nanomaterials and the ingredients are heat, a precursor, a carbon precursor and a metal catalyst. You do a little bit of magic and voila, you end up with a nanomaterial. But the reactor inside is quite chaotic and what we want to produce is this wonderful perfect uh, material, uh, atomically perfect, and we want to replace some of the carbon atoms with heteroatoms to manipulate the electronic properties and how are we going to do that? Because if we can't control nanomaterials production, they're pretty useless for applications. Ho I'm hoping to be able to prove you that we actually can make it. There are a couple of pictures here on, uh, of graphene that contains nitrogen. You see the brighter atom, that's nitrogen, and it has an effect on the local uh, carbon atoms surrounding it, and you can see that in the other picture, the red one, where you see the local density of states is changed just by the presence of this atom. There are various factors that uh, Im influence the formation, and here you see graphene on copper, which is a standard method, and I'm um, showing you that the uh, substrate alone also has a strong influence on the graphene domains. You see these different shapes. And what you need for your application is you need a continuous sheet. Now try joining these crazy shapes together. You find a lot of defects. With the help of the ERC, we'll be we've been able to uh, patent a device that allows us to monitor what's going on in our chemical vapor deposition reactor and local chemistry to find out what's going on, which molecules form what material and which molecules are basically wasted. And it helps us to control the structure and to control the composition and the properties of these materials. So for example, uh, we've been able to fill these uh, nanotubes with magnetic materials and we could show that they're useful for drug delivery, for example, by functionalizing nitrogen containing uh, magnetic carbon nanotubes that we move from A to B, for example, or if you combine conducting materials or semiconducting materials with insulating materials, you could create efficient electronic materials or sensors or you basically the floor is open to you and to your imagination what you could make out of it, provided that you have enough material available. Now there are other materials that we can go down and that's silicon oxide for example, you see here these three-dimensional structures based on silicon dioxide, they could be used as scaffolds for drug testing, for example, um, uh, reinforcing composites materials, sensors, or you can imagine you know, functionalizing this further, they could be as catalyst materials, and if you're thinking back to 0D, 1D, and 2D, if you reassemble these individual components into a three-dimensional structure, here we have flatlands of tungsten disulfide put together in a three-dimensional form to form this flower that could be a catalyst support or 
some sort of an emission device, but we need the know-how, how to create these nanomaterials by design, and we need the know-how, how we can upscale so that we can actually engage with people who are working on the applications, and there are many more applications out there that we are not aware today. But we have the building blocks, we just need to do the next step of taking these building blocks that we're making into society, into the applications. And that leads me to my question is how can we um, take customized nanomaterials to solve society's problems? Thank you.